upon your flaws. They drain your time. And they never leave you alone. Hey, I need to run a few errands. Can you watch my dog? Again. Good to see everybody. We were packed house last uh, service. Every almost every seat. It was like 780 people on campus last. Week. Isn't that awesome? Man? Come on, let's give a guy a good. Well, one more time, I need your help. Can we welcome all of our first-time guests in our online campus this morning? Come on, give them a big hand. Thank you for being here. I hope when you leave this place, you can say it was good for me to be in the house of God. Now, I want to warn you all, red tape. This mess is gonna make people mad. I'm just, I'm, they're going to be mad. I'm going to tell you, be mad. I'm going to tell you like my daddy used to tell me, though. You can get glad the same pants to get mad in, bless God. <laughs> my, my dad used to tell me that all the time, and I was like, I don't want to. But I didn't say it out loud. <laughs> Y'all ain't never real, been real bold in your bedroom when your parents wasn't nowhere near? <laughs> I wish he would, my dad. And he could, what'd you say? I was just thanking Jesus. He was my daddy and stuff. And <laughs> glad he was here. But uh, we are... Uh, we're in a series called Leeches, and uh, this is part number three of a part four series. Uh, we know what leeches do. Leeches suck your blood, and we're talking about relational leeches, how they suck the life out of you. And so week number one, if you missed any of that, we talked about controlling and manipulative people. Last week, we talked about people that are extremely critical and never have anything good to say. Next week's going to be extremely powerful, too, I think. It's how do we do with hypocritical, how do we deal with hypocritical people? And that's, ooh, Jesus, help us. And so uh, you got those and uh, people living around us in our lives and they claim to be one thing, but they're actually living another thing. And what do we do? How do we manage that? But today I want to talk about people that can be overly needy, needy. The people that, man, we love them, we care about them, but they always need a little bit more then we can possibly give if, in fact, I think there's a spiritual principle that I've told you before in, in every family, in every small group, on every team, there is always at least one crazy person. Come on, somebody. That's a spiritual principle. You're missing me this morning. In fact, I think I read in the Bible somewhere it says where two or three are gathered, at least one of them is nuts. And so... Um, <laughs> Something like that. It may, I may have added or taken away a little bit. But, um, you know, when, when you see them, immediately you know the conversation's going to go longer than you want it to go. You can't ask them how they're doing because that just opens the floodgate. How are you? Oh, I'm so glad you asked. And they're like 50 years old, right? And Like my age. And they're like, well, when I was in third grade, things didn't... Like, Lady... Sir, we do not have time to go to Little House on the Prairie right now. Can, I'm sorry I asked. I wish I had. But you get the annual medic report. It's just never nothing good. It's just always bad. And, and, and you see them at the grocery store and you want to go down that aisle because you need bread, but you're willing to go home without it. <laughs> I'm not. Listen, don't act like you're all spiritual. Y'all know what I'm talking about. You're like, oh, no. no, no, no. Just keep on, keep on going down the thing. And what stinks is they're on the ice cream aisle. And you're like, ah! <laughs> I can't go home without Belle. And so, but they, they dominate your time. And you often hear the same story over and over again because they don't really want to change. They just want to ear. It's a victim mentality. And, and when you do something for them out of the kindness of your own heart, it's never enough. You know what I'm talking about? And, and they, you give and they want more. You give and they want more. And it could be uh, somebody in your, your life that, man, that they're always in need of money. And I understand people go through the hard times, but you give them a little bit and then they need more. And you give them a little bit, then they need more. And then they need more. And they need more. Or maybe it's the person at your office that's really insecure and they're always fishing for compliments. How does this look? Do I look good? In what does this do for me? Da, da, da. It could be your friend who is the hot mess 
and they're always on the struggle bus. They've never got on another route, bless God. It's always the struggle bus. And, 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 and if you know somebody and they might be with you, do not point at them. Do not look at them. Just, just look forward and pretend like you don't know who I'm talking about. <laughs> because it's complicated as followers of Christ. We care about these people and we want to help. But whatever we do, it doesn't ever seem to be enough. So, so how do we love those people who are always in need in a way that actually lifts them up without hurting them at the same time? So I'm going to give you three truths and I'm going to get out of here this morning. Here's number one. When we give, we're going to give strategically. Why do you say that, Pastor Todd? Why? Because most of the time we give emotionally. We give emotionally. We, we see a need and because we care, we care, we care, we just react and, and do the first thing that comes easy, something often that actually makes us feel better about ourselves. I need some help in here. And, and we give them because emotionally we engage when somebody's in need and that helps us feel good. And sometimes it even relieves our own shame and our own guilt in certain situations. And so we want to give strategically. So instead of focusing Focusing on just what they want or, or what gives us relief or relieves guilt. Instead, we're going to ask them, you may be asking for what you want, but what do you really need? Right, yeah. and, and not just in the moment, but what could help them long term? I have people all the time, man. I got to get a little gas. Money. Yeah, gas my hand. My, I'll show order my rent. Can you help? Yeah, I can help you with your rent. Here's the problem. If you don't fix the situation, rent's going to come around next month. Car payment's going to show up again. I need some people this morning. It's going to come back around. And, and Peter and John, they did this in a brilliant way. One day they're going to a, the temple and they see a man. Uh, he's crippled. Isn't it crazy? You got a man with an ugly problem at a gate called Beautiful. I, I want to preach on that sometime, but let me go ahead. But he's got serious needs. He's unable to walk, so he ha perhaps has somebody, his friends or family members that are willing to carry him every day to this gate and so that he could ask for money and, and people would give it to him. And, and that's what he wanted, and, and people would meet him at where he's at. But watch what happens here in Acts chapter 3. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John, and then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave his attention, and, and what was he expecting? He was expecting to get something from them. Here's what those who are really needy know, that if you ask long enough, if you're consistent and persistent, eventually there's somebody that's going to give in. Hello. There's somebody that's going to give in and respond and give you what you're asking for, even if it isn't what you really need. Because this guy's learned every single day that, that if I just rely on others, they'll, get, they'll carry me to the gate. If I, they'll come by and people will feel guilty or feel shameful and they'll drop some money on me and all that stuff. And, and, and it would be what he wanted, but it was never what he needed. Somebody help me, man. Think about it. What did the guy want? And the answer is easy. What did he want? Money, money right? And, and what would be easy to give? money. Toss him a little change. Feel good about herself. Look how spiritual I am. I gave him what he wanted and we go on our way feeling emotionally better about ourselves. But Peter and John didn't respond emotionally. They were led by the spirit under the power of God and they didn't give the guy what he wanted. Instead, they gave him what he needed. Come on, somebody. Verse 6, Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the hand, he helped him up, and then instantly, how fast? Instantly, the man's feet and ankles became strong. Instead of giving him a hand out, what they did was give the guy a miraculous hand up. And it's so easy to give a handout, but what may take more time, what may take more faith, what may take more effort, what may take more prayer, what may take more sacrifice, rather than give somebody what they want, what they want, maybe we need to spend time in prayer and give them what they need. In the name of Jesus, I could give you what you're asking for. I could give you what God, or I could give you what God wants you to have, which is far more than you've ever dreamed of even asking for. 
because he doesn't just meet our needs. He does it abundantly, exceedingly, above all we can think or ask. So some of you have been asking for things, but it's really not what you need, but you've been asking for what you want. And God said, if I could get your need, I can meet your needs according to my riches, and it would be exceedingly abundantly above all you think or ask. If you believe that, give God a good shout of praise. Hallelujah, man. And, and so, uh, what, uh, and when you do that, so w- when we start giving strategically uh-huh. rather than emotionally, here's what the person's going to do. The moment you try to give them something other than what they're asking for, you're going to get this. If you really love me, <laughs> if you really love me, you would do this. If you would really love me, you would give me the, you would make more time for me. You would do this for me. If you love me, you would give me the money. And, but, 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 but we need to have the wisdom and the real love to say, because I love you, I'm not just going to give you what you want, but the Spirit is leading me to give you the help that you really need. We give strategically. What's that person going to say? I don't need a Bible verse. I don't need prayer. What I need is $300 to make my car payment. And what I already know is they just bought an Apple Watch or a pair of brand new Yeezys. And they sitting on the couch all day playing Fortnite and Xbox. And, and, and instead of getting a job, any, anybody know what I'm talking about right here? And, and so we, we may say, that's what you want. But what I'm going to do is give you a job application. My dad told me one time, hey, the best thing I can do for you is give you a job application. And I'm like, well, uh, yeah, okay, but um, can you give me some money right now? <laughs> Dad said no. Even one time, I, I used to have real long hair. I had the best mullet in the world. <laughs> me and Trish got married. It was down in between my shoulder blades. It was like Billy Ray Cyrus mullet, I'm telling you. And I had it when I was a kid, and I, was, I wanted to, to, to get a car, and I told my dad, I said, I'd get a car. And, and my dad said, you want me to help you with a car? You better cut that hair. Now, why, what's the hair got to do with anything? Like, Dad, I just want a car. And he said, you, you better cut that hair. I'm telling you, I ain't going to help you if you don't cut that hair. And I said, hey, Daddy, Jesus had long hair. And Daddy said, and Jesus walked everywhere he went too. I just, <laughs> I'm like, you ain't wrong, but, you know, go and put a little something, something on my book, you know. Like, dang, you savage, bro. My dad just savage. <laughs> I'm trying to get biblical, and he just got theoretical, and I was like, oh, shoot, man. And, and, and so, man, you want me to validate you, but what you need is to learn who you are in Christ. Listen, to love yourself, to accept yourself. So I'm not going to continue to meet a need that I was never designed to meet. You, you, <laughs> you want more time with me, but what you need to do is develop your own identity in him. And this may be what you want, but God is leading me to give you what you need. And and I'm not just going to do what you want. So we got to pray, God, give me the wisdom to do what's right. I'm not just going to tell you what you want to hear, but give me the courage to lovingly say what they need to hear in that moment. We, We need to be prayerful. You're saying, Todd, don't help people? Absolutely not. That's not what I'm saying at all. But there is a, there is a difference in helping people. And helping them continue in the same broken cycle that they're in over and over again. There's a difference. You may not like it because you may be a part of that cycle. Here's what I want to tell you. You don't got to stay broke, busted, and disgusted. I got a God that can meet all of your needs this morning. I'm just telling Well, you don't know what it is to be poor. Are you, are, you, are you serious? You see me now. Nobody knows how I grew up. My dad used to have to put plywood in the bottom of the floor so our, our feet didn't go through the floorboard on the way to school. He had a Corvair, y'all. Y'all, most of y'all don't even know what a Corvair is. We had this old Corvair. It didn't even have a heater. No heater, no defroster. You know what our defroster was? We took a Folgers coffee can and put a roll of toilet paper in there and poured some alcohol on it, and it'll burn for a long, long time and defrost your window so you could get to work. So don't tell me I don't know nothing about being poor. We were so poor, we couldn't even pay a tip. Poor people called us poor. I went to school and somebody, I didn't know. And you, when you're poor, you don't know. I didn't know. Everybody, my, all my friends was poor. I went to school one day and said, hey, you poor. And I went home and told daddy. I said, daddy, did you know we was poor? He said, oh, yeah, I've been knowing that a long time. <laughs> and I said, I just found out today at school we didn't have no money and stuff like that. But, so don't, don't see me in my now and have no idea where I've come from. 
I, I just want to say that. You, sometimes we judge people in the season they're in, and we don't know how many seasons they had to go through to get to this one. I had people all the time, I'm getting off track, but let me, hey, Pastor Todd, will you pray for me to have this anointing? And I'm like, no, you, you pray for your own anointing. I'm not praying to give you mine. And they're like, well, we want your anointing. Well, then make sure you want that because if you want my anointing, you got to be prepared to have three of your babies die. You got to be prepared for what people to walk out of your life. You got to be people that say they'll stick with you forever and then leave you the very next day. So make sure you know what you're asking for when you see somebody on a stage because you have no idea where they came from. I'm just telling you. And I'm fine with going back. That was trailer house living was the best living because you could flush something down the toilet and run outside and see it come out the set the tank. <laughs> I'm 50 years old and I still get a kick out of watching a race car come out that pipe. I'm telling you the truth, boy. Ah, I'm not bougie at all. Now, Trish, boy. I could go back to the trailer park. Trish, you're going to go by yourself. You go by yourself. Rent me a hotel. And by hotel, like Ritz Carlton. That's when, when we go camping, Trish's idea of camping's Holiday Inn Express, y'all. I'm just telling y'all that. Not even Motel 6. He's like, hmm. I said, Trish, you ain't never lived till you woke up and somebody was nibbling on your toes. <laughs> what was nibbling on your toes? It was a rat. <laughs> anyway, listen, you got to be prayerful. You got to be prayerful. God, I need you to lead me. Because it's so easy when we see somebody in need to do what's easy and makes me feel better. But what's right may take more wisdom. What's right may take more discernment. What's right may take more time. It may take more sacrifice. But because we're followers of Christ, we don't just go and relieve an immediate need. We want to give a hand up and not just a hand out. And we got to get this right. And so how do we minister to somebody's in need? Number one, I'm going to give strategically. Number two, I'm going to serve wisely. Look at the way Jesus cared for people. What did he do? He served selflessly. He loved authentically. He gave generously. He taught faithfully. He listened compassionately. And then after he did all those things, he would step off and go aside and reconnect with God to get recharged spiritually and then go out and serve faithfully again. Listen, if you're not to every Sunday you come, you ought to bring a fruit basket in the spirit realm and that fruit basket ought to be empty. And while you're here during your worship and during the word, you ought to fill that thing back up and make sure that it's filled to the top so that when you walk out of here on Monday and somebody's in a bad way at work, you can say, here, this is what I got from the Lord at church. I got more than I need. You take a little bit of that and a little bit on Tuesday and Wednesday. But when you show back up on Sunday, that thing better be empty. Don't let it rot on you. It ought to be empty. And, and, and so you can go out and do it again. And you see this rhythm over and over again in Jesus' life. I give out. He gave out. He gave out. He unplugs. He goes and receives from his father. Because pouring out of a full cup, you've you got to be able to pour out of a full cup and not an empty one. And here's what you need to know. In order for you to keep giving out, at some point you have got to stop. I don't know who I'm preaching to. But you have got to stop and fill back up for yourself. I'm not against you helping everybody you're helping. Keep doing what you're doing. But you better take some time for yourself because you're going to give out sooner or later. And if you've given out to everybody else and nobody's been coming by your house, who's going to help you get up? I'm just telling you. I'm just telling you, you've got to take care of yourself. Mark 135, very early in the morning while it was dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and then Simon and his companions went to look for Jesus. What I'm about to tell you is exactly what happens to moms that got little kids. They go in the bathroom and try to hide. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Anybody online know what I'm talking about? They went on, and, and, and Jesus went off to a place, and Simon's like, Jesus, where are you? Jesus, we need you. Jesus, hurry up. Jesus, come out of here. And, and when they found him, they exclaimed, everybody looking for you. Think about it. What do you do? You go to the bathroom. You shut the door. You're trying to get a moment of sanity. Uh, <laughs> sanity. <laughs> See, I already lost that. I ain't got none. You're trying to get, you're trying to get a moment of privacy, and the th next thing you hear is, mom, mom. Mom, 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 mom. It's like that old Mervyn's commercial. 
Remember the Mervis commercial with a open, 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 open. And those kids are like, mom, 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 mom. And then what do you do? Because you're a good mom. You hold your breath so they don't know that you're in there. <laughs> a real talk. Don't come to hear a real talk. And so you, maybe if they don't hear me, they'll go away. And then what's the next thing you see? Fingers under the door. <laughs> mom, 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 mom. You're like, cow. On, take me away for the love of God, man. But what I'm trying to say, you need to unplug. He said, but Todd, I, I, I don't mind helping people. I, I, I hear you. But remember when you're on the airplane and they tell you if we lose altitude at any time, oxygen masks are going to fall down. When they fall down, put one on you and then you got to decide which kids you love the most and put it on them. <laughs> but if mama's not healthy, How's she going to take care of everybody else? I, I, I'm glad that you're selfless. I'm glad that you give up. But at some point, you got to say, I need some time for me. I need, you kids can figure it out for yourself. There's some bread. There's some grilled cheese in there. Get going and make you a sandwich. And your kids will be like, ah, a sandwich. Oh, my God. <laughs> you got to take time for you first. Listen, man. Think about the story of the Good Samaritan. He, he, he gets beat up on the road, and, and, and this, this, this Jew guy gets beat up on the road. A Samaritan comes along, which is all messed up in the first place because Jews don't like Samaritans, and Samaritans don't like Jews. And so this is a, a total ironic story that this guy would be helping him. But he comes along, and he bandages them all up. He puts oil and gives them wine, and, and everybody needs wine when they get hurt. Amen. No, I'm just playing. He gives them oil, and he gives wine, and they wrap him up, and then he puts the own, his man on the, his own donkey. And he walks him while he lets the other guy ride. And he takes him over to the innkeeper. And he said, here's a couple bucks. Can you house him for a couple days? I'm going to go away, but I'll come back. And any charges he incurs while I'm gone, I'll make sure that I'll take care of it when I get back. Are you hearing what I'm telling you? And you think about that. You say, well, well, what's the big deal, Todd? My question is this. Where did he go and why did he leave? Now, we don't know because Jesus doesn't tell the story. But, but I can assume, if you would allow me for a minute, that, that, that either he went back to his family's house or he went back to his wife's and his kids or he went back to work. Because when you work, you get paid. And when you get paid, you can help pay somebody else's hotel bill. When they get in trouble, what did he do? He went back and in some form of fashion, he, he did what he had to keep doing to keep his health moving in the right direction so that when the next guy got hurt on the road, he would be in a posture to help somebody else out. Are you? Sometimes you got to take care of you so that you can take care of others. Every now and then, I have to unplug. Pastor Jackie at Church on the Rock, some of the best words he ever told me was this. Todd, you can't say yes often if you don't say no occasionally. You can't say yes to everything. And people get upset with me. And I, I, I need you to do this and I need you to do I, I, I can't do it all. I, in fact, I, I, I'm not even physical able to do all the demands that are on my life. That's why we got a staff at the church. That's why people help at the church. We do this and do this and do that. And he said, well, you love them more than you love me. No, no, I, I don't love them more than you. But we've already had time together, and they didn't have time with me. And so I'm trying to help them get to a place that they can go out and help other people. Amen. I'm not saying anybody's less than the other people. I'm just saying there's only so much of the 24 hours a day that you can give. Right. And on top of being a pastor, I still got to know how to be a husband. And y'all, I need the most help. That's why I need the most help. I don't know why I sound like Bernie Mac all of a sudden, but <laughs> you know what I'm trying to say to you. <laughs> the kids are done me crazy. <laughs> it's a shepherd for the devil, that's what he said. <laughs> but I, I, I'm just, I got to figure out how to be a dad. And you know what? Somewhere in there where you're shuffling all these cards, the same way you do, I got to figure out when I spend time with my father. So that I don't come up here and pour out of an empty cup. It's imperative. That's, what I'm, that's why I told you at the beginning of the summer, some of the most spiritual things some of you are going to do is take your family on vacation. Work's always going to be there. But time, listen, Hunter's 20 years old, man. It's just like that. 20 years old, and he's like that. And, and, and I'm so glad. Am I mad that we took vacations? No. Am I mad that I spent money that, that maybe I shouldn't have spent? No way. You know why? Because I only had 20 years to invest in that kid. And he's still at home. I'm trying to get him out right now. But he's still. <laughs> I told him I ain't got 21. I got 20. But <laughs> I was like, 
You got to know when to say no that so you can say yes to the right things. That's all I'm trying to tell you. So you want to be able to pour out. I'm going to give strategically. I'm going to serve wisely. And here's number three. I'm going to trust completely. What do you mean, Todd? God, we're going to do what we know you led us to do, but then we're going to trust you with the results because you're faithful. I'm not responsible to be God. I'm responsible to take it to God. And, and, and you lead us, and I'm going to do what you asked me to do, but, but, but I'm trusting the consequences to you. Here's the problem, and, and this is going to be a strong. This is going to be a real strong statement I make. Some of you may get upset, but stay with me. It's insulting and dangerous for me to ever think that I am somebody else's answer. It is insulting and dangerous for you to think that you are the source that meets somebody else's need. Why, Todd? It is dishonoring to God to say that we are necessary in every case that every need is met. When, when we are not somebody's answer, Jesus is the answer. We are the delivery system, but he is the power. We are the conduit, but he is the power. If you think God needs you to fix everybody else, then can I tell you your God is too small? God needs my help. No, he needs to get out of the way. Get out of the way. But here's what we do, man. You ever, you get your, your car beat up by hell, and I mean, it's just trash, and you take it over to the, the body shop, and they're like, oh, man, this is in bad shape. It's, it's going to take us weeks to get this fixed right here, man, and, and we'll do the best we can. And you're like, okay, I'll be back at five. <laughs> no, no, I, I don't know we're having a breakdown in communication, but I just want to reiterate, your car is in bad shape. It's going to need to be here for a little bit in order for us to give it the attention that it needs so that when you pick it up, it looks like you want it to look and you have the product that you need that, that you're paying for. Okay, I'll see you at five. I don't know where we're missing each other. Well, I'm trying to tell you, your car not going to be ready at five today, tomorrow, the next day, the next day, the week after that, or the week after that. You got a couple months of beat up. It's going to take me a little while to fix this car. Now, I know it looks bad, but I'm telling you, I can fix this car if you'll leave it in my hands. But if you pick it up every day... I can't be held responsible for how long the detour takes because you're so busy trying to fix this thing yourself if you would just leave it in my hands, my God. There are some things that we say that we have taken to the altar, but then we pick them back up and take them with us, and we're wondering why God's not able to do what we've asked him to do. It's simply because you didn't leave it at his feet. You picked it up and decided you'll be Messiah for the day. But guess what? You're not a good Messiah. I'm not a good Messiah. That's why Jesus Christ is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You can't do it. You've got to turn it over to him, and you can't pick it up every day thinking it got fixed. I'm helping somebody. And so other people's like, thank God, I need a break. <laughs> if you think you're necessary in every way, you might be short-circuiting the process that God is already doing because you keep rescuing people when God has set up natural consequences to teach them you reap what you sow. How often do you think that we might be interfering with the very thing that God is trying to do? How many times have we asked God to rescue us, to get us out? Lord, it's, it's, this is bad. I want out of the oven. I want out of the oven. And it's uncomfortable here. It is hot in here. I am miserable in here. I want to do something else. And God says, I hear you. It's not that I hear you. It's this. If I take you out of the oven too early, you won't develop the way I need you to develop. Come on, somebody. You won't have everything you need to get down the road. So I'm willing to let you go through a couple things so you can be become the thing that I've called you to be. Oh, I'm willing to let you go through a couple trials so that when you come out, it's not that you were broke, busted, and disgusted. It's that you came out on the other side and you can tell other people that the goodness of the Lord was with me all the days of my life. It's not that I don't hear your prayer. I don't know who I'm preaching to. It's not that he doesn't hear your prayer. He's saying, if you'll just sit for a little minute, I'm going to get more glory out of your story than you can possibly imagine. I hear you. I hear you. But it's not time to rescue. It's time to develop. 
And God does not care about your comfort. He cares about your character. Yes. I know that's not popular, but it's powerful. Galatians 6 says this, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. In other words, you're going to get back what you put out. Whoever sows to please their flesh, their sinful nature from their flesh will reap dis- destruction. Here's God's principle of harvest. Whoever sows to please the spirit from the spirit will reap eternal life. We do what's right. We, we help prayerfully. And then we trust the consequences to God and the lives of the people that we love. And this is the principle that's true all throughout Scripture. There are consequences to your behavior. Yes. You can choose your actions, but you cannot choose your consequences. Some of the decisions you've made in your life have led you to the place where you are right now. And you're mad at everybody else, but it's you pulling the trigger. <laughs> Some of you, <laughs> I, I'm responsible for my actions. I, once I break those actions, I can't help it. I'm never mad. I, I have a speed problem when I travel. <laughs> I like to go faster than what that little sign, I think it's an implied 75. <laughs> However, the, the Texas Department of Safety has let me know that 75 is not implied. It's actually appreciated. Um, and I never get mad. Why am I mad for him giving me a ticket when I'm the one that broke the law? Stupid cop, people breaking people's houses, everybody stealing things. Are you out here writing tickets? Dougley, do right. Won't you go over there? Get a real criminal. Oh, don't act like I ain't never been in the car with you. Uh, they just, that, that was their job. Why am I going to get mad at them? People get in my car and they see this thing on my thing and they're like, why do you have a radar detector? I said, let me tell y'all something. I don't own a radar detector. Pastor Todd, I see your radar detector right there. I said, I don't know what you're looking at. I do not see a radar detector. (laughs) Well, what do you call that right there? I said, I call it a prophet. It tells me of the things that are to come. (laughs) Pray for your pastor. That's all I'm saying. (laughs) Pray for your pastor. You can justify anything, can't you? The Lord knows it's a prophet. Anyway, so listen to me. Remember Luke chapter 15, one of the most famous chapters in the Word of God. Give me about five minutes and I'm done. One of the most powerful stories about the prodigal son. And basically, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to break down this story for you real quick. What happens is this son goes to his dad and he said, look, you're not dying early enough. Really, it's where you're not dying soon enough. So what I want you to do is go ahead and give me all my inheritance because I know there's a lot of money coming my way. Go ahead and give me my money, and I'm going to bounce, and I'm going to go do what I want to do. And the dad says, all right, I'm, I'm going to give you what you asked for, even though it's not what you need. So he gives him what he asked for. The kid has, you know, it, when you didn't have to work for the money, have you ever noticed how easy it is to spend it? <laughs> I, know how much, I know how long it takes me to make $100. Oh, I can see y'all bougie. Let me, I know how long it takes me to make $100. So when you come ask me for $100, I'm like, we're going to have a conversation. <laughs> Bernie Mac is in the house. I'm just telling you. <laughs> That's all I can hear. Pray for me. <laughs> Listen to me. When you, when you don't know how much is invested and what it took, you don't appreciate what was given to you. That's all I'm saying. So the son goes out, man, he spends it on what you would spend, on, on, on going to the strip club, on getting drunk, on, on drugs and all of this, whatever. The Bible says, I forget the word of you, riotous living. Uh, the, there's a big word there I can't remember. Forgive me. Go home, read the story. You'll find it. There's your homework. And he, and he spent all of his money on this stupid thing. And, and, and then he's got nothing. And, and he's like, man, maybe, maybe I can go back to my dad's house. And maybe I I can never be a son again. That's okay. I understand that I blew everything he gave me, but maybe I can go get a job on the farm and I can work there because his servants are uh, living better than I am. What you see in the story, though, is every day, every day the father went to look for his son. Every day he was out on the porch. Is this the day my son comes home? Is this the day? My son come home. Every day he prayed, every day he looked, but what you don't see is that he went out to rescue. We're getting somewhere now. He, he led him 
end up in the pig pen, a Jewish boy. And now he's feeding an animal that they wouldn't even serve on their table. Because make no mistake about it, when you mess up and you fall in, sin will make you pay more than you thought you would ever pay, make you stay longer than you thought you would ever stay, and make you do what you said you would never do. And now you have this Jewish boy feeding things that are detestable to his family. Careful, careful if you're not given over to things that you'll find yourself feeding things that won't be able to feed you back. You'll find yourself giving to things that won't be able to give back. And, and then it says he came to his senses. His, his sinful decisions took him to a place that made him realize that even in my, as a servant back at my dad's house, that, 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 that they live better than I do. Maybe I can go back and I can apologize to my dad and, he, and see if he'll take me back. Even as a servant, watch me, rock bottom is different from everybody. Rock bottom is different. He came to a senses. The father loved this boy long enough to let the consequences play out in his life so that the son would come to a place where he said, even in my daddy's house, servants live better than the way I'm living right now. I have got to change what I'm doing and find my way back. And what we need to understand is that rescuing is not always helping the people that you think it's helping. All the time, people know about my past. They, every, almost every Sunday, I have somebody walk up to me. Hey, I know you used to be a drug addict. Would you call my son? I, I know you used to be a drug addict. Will you call my daughter? And this answer may offend you, and it may upset you. And my answer is always this, no. <gasps> well, you the pastor of the church. I already know my job. I don't come to your job and tell you what to do. You, I can't believe, if you really love people, you would go out there and call, no, no, you, you know why I don't call? Because I've been a drug addict. And I didn't get sober because my mom and daddy asked the preacher to call me. I got sober because I stayed in the pig pen long enough and I wanted to wake up and do something different. So I know you get mad at me, but I'm telling you, rescuing is not always helping. If they're always late to work every day and you're the alarm clock, maybe they need to lose that job in order to be responsible and know what time it is to get up. If they're partying all night long and they're doing all these dumb things, maybe they need to lose their scholarship to recognize how much has been given to them. You're not hearing me. If somebody continues to charge up debt and go on vacation and buy outfits and the car and they can't make their rent payment, maybe there are ways to learn how to make that rent payment. When you spend a couple nights in the back seat or out on the street, you may learn that, that getting evicted is more popular or, or better or worse than me having these new shoes. You're not hearing me. Stop buying the Gucci belts and the purses and the shoes that you know you couldn't afford in the first place and pay your bills the way you need to pay your bills. I said it last week we got a whole generation of men raised up right now that have been mama to death they need to learn how to be men I am so there were times my dad made me so mad and I would go to my room and straight up I'd be in there like you the meanest word in the world everybody's going to the party and I can't go to the party I don't know why I can't go to the party everybody's going in there you know my dad was gangster he come up there he said I ain't everybody's dad I'm your dad I ain't that gum I want to ride my bike in the street no you can't ride your bike in the street I want to ride my bike in the street you not riding the bike in the street. Everybody riding a bike in the street, Todd or Daddy. Everybody in the street. Look here, boy. You know why I don't want you riding your bike in the street? It's not because I'm trying to keep you from having fun. It's because I'm, I'm trying to keep you from getting ran over. And I would much rather you listen to my words than have to go through the experience. And what I'm trying to tell you this morning, there are things that people are protecting you from, and it's not because they don't love you. It's not because they don't support you. They're trying to tell you, you reap what you sow, and if you do better, you'll reap. You'll reap better. You'll reap better. Oh, it's going to be bad in here. Listen to me. What I hope everybody in this room will do was always help from a posture of humility. I heard people all the time say, well, you know, I got this project person in my life. No, no, nobody on this earth is a project person. They're God's people. Yeah. I don't see people as a project. I see somebody that God can enable me to help and do better. And, and you know what I've come to find out? 
that when I look in others that I see that they need help, they wind up helping me more than I've ever helped them. I go to a poor nation, like when I go preach to Nicaragua, got best food over there, I'm going to tell you that right now. Best food. Worst food is the Czech Republic. Best food. Oh, Israel's got some good stuff. Anyway, anyway, Israel, meat. I mean, they got some good meat over there. But Nicaragua got Mexican food or Nicaraguan food. This is my love language. They put this food on the table. I was like, I love you. Okay. But when I go there, it's considered a third world country. And there's a lot of places, man, in that country. They got no running water. They've got no utilities. They, they have no proper place to even go to the restroom. And sometimes I sit back, Cody, if I can be honest, sometimes I sit back and I'm like, well, thank God I'm here. I'm going to be able to help them from Lubbock, Texas. And the worship center is going to do all of this stuff. And, and, I, and, and I'm like, and then I start looking around and I thought, wait a minute. Maybe they don't got water. And maybe they don't got electricity. Maybe they don't have a bathroom. But they also have a peace that I don't have. And they have a joy that I don't have. And they seem to have this contentment rather than being more invested in material things. They're more invested in their family. Oh, you're not hearing me. They, they might be in material need, but I'm in some sort of spiritual need, relational need. And instead of seeing myself as someone who meets somebody else's need or someone who meets my need, suddenly I start to realize that we're all just a part of the family of God. And if we would just continue to point each other to Jesus, then Jesus is the one that can meet all of our needs at the same time. And I realized all of a sudden that I really can't experience the best part about the presence of God until I'm in it with somebody I love. Until I'm in his presence. A personal relationship with Jesus is awesome, but I am convinced a shared relationship with Jesus is better. It's just more better. And, and where two or three come together in his name and he's there in a different way. You can pray for me from a distance and that's powerful. But if we lock hands together and we pray together, there is something more that happens in the middle of our midst. And suddenly we are mutually in need. We are mutually broken people going before a great savior. And he's lifting you and he's lifting me. And I'm not better. I'm just helping give you a hand up at the moment and you're helping me get a hand up in some other moment and there we are like the body of Christ mutually needing the healing power of God and finding it and enjoying it together at the same time at the same time David said this is Psalm 70 as for me I'm poor and needy come quickly to me God you are my help you are my deliverer and please don't delay hurry get here as fast as you can so in any moment that we look at somebody else and say, I'm here to help their needs. No, no, I'm just here to point them to Jesus in the same way that they may help me find him. Come on, somebody. And when Jesus uses me to give them a hand up, I have the blessings of knowing that God uses me as an instrument in the same way that he might use them as an instrument to bring something to my life that I needed that I didn't know I needed. Now, you hear what I'm telling you? It is being a part of a broader family, broken people in the presence of a good God. And that is how you care and that is how you love for needy people. And that's how God wants us to care and meet needy people. Equally, watch me, equally broken, equally needy. And that's how we make Jesus known and the way we love because when the world looks on, please don't miss this, when the world looks on, They're not going to believe that we are followers of Christ by our theology. They're not going to believe that we are followers of Christ by our doctrine. And they won't believe it because we have great worship. And they won't believe it because it's contemporary worship. No, they will know that we are followers of Christ by the way that we love one another. The best witness that anybody in this room is how well do you love? That's how we're going to be known. You know how I know you're a Christ follower? Because the way you love people. The way you love people. Because I love people, I am willing to lose some arguments so I don't lose a relationship. I don't care that I've got friends that are Catholic and Baptist and Assembly of God and Church of God and heathen and Presbyterian and, and, and all the other religions. I don't care about it. When I get to heaven, he's not going to ask me, Baptist, Baptist section. 
Methodist, or if you're Church of Christ, Church of Christ. <laughs> That's wrong right there. <laughs> We're going to put you over here because they're the only ones that are here. They think. Assembly of God, Pentecost. Oh, we're over there with all the flag wavers. All the people that run around circles with the flags. Oh, that's that's Pentecostal. Yeah, I just thought they were trying to land a plane. I didn't. I, didn't. I don't know. Hey, man, you got the blood of Jesus applied to your sins? Yeah. Enter thou in, thou good and faithful servant. I just think sometimes we're focusing on things that we really shouldn't be focusing on. Todd, you're not interested in religion? Zero. Zero interest in religion. Zero interest in your cross that you're wearing and your earrings are around your neck. Zero. Zero. I'm going to hurt you. Zero interest in your fish bumper sticker. Zero interest in your bumper sticker that says dumb things. In case of rapture, this car may be unmanned. Come on, man. Come on. You're making us look bad. Come on, man. Zero. You know what I am interested in? And you having a relationship with a man named Jesus Christ who's not a man. He is the son of God. And he's the only way. So if you've got need this morning, there's one that can meet your need according to his riches. And not just meet it, but exceedingly abundantly above all you think or ask. But in order to get your need met, you're going to have to tell him what you need instead of what you want. One last thing. Give me three minutes. Remember the guy that had the kid that was demon-possessed? And he, they took him to Jesus because he was always throwing himself in the fire. They couldn't even go to the barbecues with the other families because every time they're barbecuing, they look over and their kid's trying to get in the barbecue pit. And you're like, dang, God. Where's John at? Well, he's in there in the barbecue pit again, messing up the hot dogs and stuff. And, John, get out of the fire. Get out of the fire. Can't go to the swimming pool. Can't go swimming. We're going to have a swimming party. Bring everybody. Can't take John. Why? Everybody's out eating the snacks. John's at the bottom of the pool trying to drown himself. And his dad is exhausted. And he said, man, if you can do anything. Man, that's just pitiful, right? Anything. If, man, he's been like this since childhood. If you can just give him a pill that maybe he can sleep for a couple, 24, 48 hours. That I, I need a break. I'm at my breaking point. All I've done is try to meet his needs, Jesus, my God. All I've done is take care, make sure he doesn't drown. I'm trying to make sure he don't burn up. Jesus, I'm doing the best I can trying to help everybody, but I'm in bad shape myself. Help me, Jesus. Can you do the healing thing? Can you just heal him? Can you give me a little relief, even if you can't make him whole? A little relief. I just got to have some rest. And Jesus says, anything. I can do everything. You want me to heal your boy? Yes. Yes, that's what I, I want, Ronnie. Nothing happens. Do you believe? Watch this. Yes, Jesus, I believe. Help me with my unbelief. Immediately the boy gets healed. Just back it up. What do you want? I want him healed. Do you believe I can do it? I believe. Help me with my unbelief. The boy gets healed. What are you telling me, Todd? I'm telling you, sometimes we're asking God to do things that we think he ought to do first. But what he needs is not to heal your head. He needs to get to your heart. You're asking God to do, can he heal the kid? Yeah, the kid's not the, the demon's not the issue. It's your unbelief. So sometimes the thing you're asking God to do is not the thing he'll do first, my Lord. Because sometimes we'll ask at the point of desperation. And God said, man, if you will just really ask me for what you need instead of what you want, that boy can walk home healed. That boy can walk home whole. So this morning, rather than focus on what it is you may want, why don't we take a couple minutes? 
as you bow your heads and you close your eyes and you ask the Lord, what is it that I need? I've been asking for what I want, but maybe my unbelief is the issue. What do I need, Jesus? What do I need? Don't give me what I want today. Because maybe I've been asking for the wrong thing, but for the love of God, would you give me what I need? I'm desperate. I'm exhausted. I help everybody else and nobody is helping me. I have got to leave this place better than the way I came. Heads are bowed, no one's looking around, and you'll just be honest. Pastor Todd, that's me. I've been asking for things. I don't know if it's what I want. I don't know what I need. I just know I, I, I need some help. If that's you, let me see your hand. Yeah. Yeah, man, there's nothing wrong with having your hand up. And we, every Sunday, we expect people to come to the altar. We did this hoping that it needs would get exposed so that you could get healed. You raised your hand. Will you take another step of faith? Will you come and just let us pray for you?